in Sister Outsider, Black Lesbian Poet Audrey Lord, paraphrasing Paolo Freire, wrote, The true focus of revolutionary change is never merely the oppressive situations we seek to escape, but that piece of the oppressor which is planted deep within each of us. I think on the left in general, we are good at confronting systems of oppression like patriarchy as something that is out there in broader external structures, but we give very little attention to the pieces of the oppressor that are planted within ourselves and our movements so that we end up replicating in our worldviews, frameworks, ways of being, actions and consciousnesses the exact same systems we seek to destroy. So this video is about the ways in which I see the patriarchy planted within the people and community of BreadTube and how we can begin to recognise and eradicate the seeds of oppression within ourselves and our movements. For those who don't know, BreadTube, otherwise known as LeftTube or left-wing YouTube, refers to the creators and community around left-wing content online. Whilst most of what I say can be universalised to leftist movements in general, I'm going to be focusing specifically on the far left side of BreadTube because I think this is the most important platform for the sharing of radical subversive thought that would otherwise in mainstream media be censored or shut down. What we do here is incredibly important and failing to address patriarchy on the left could have fatal consequences for our movements. FD Signifier made a brilliant video about the racist framework that underpins BreadTube, so I'll be focusing mostly on patriarchy today. That being said, as Professor Kimberly Crenshaw pointed out in 1989, capitalism, white supremacy, patriarchy and so on are intersecting systems of oppression, so this video will inevitably be imperfect and incomplete. I'm also going to be making some generalisations about BreadTube, of course there are always exceptions. On top of that, I'm white, cis, able-bodied, European, so if there are perspectives I'm missing, please share them with me in the comments section. I'm not going to be calling out specific people or using clips as evidence of what I'm talking about because I think that just results in defensiveness, drama and moves the discussion to a few bad apples when in reality I think there is a whole ecosystem creating this phenomenon and we are all complicit to varying degrees. And this video isn't about making anyone feel guilt or blame, it's an invitation for introspection. This is crucial, scary, challenging, but ultimately deeply rewarding and transformative work. So what do I actually mean by internalised patriarchy or the patriarchy that lives within? Well, gender is not inherent, fixed or innate. It is a social construct that from birth assigns us binary roles of either a man or a woman. These roles are socialised into us at every level of society, from our families, education system, media and governments, such that it might not only become what we think, but how we think. This harms women as the subordinated group, queer people who don't fit the gender binary, and less discussed is how this also harms men. In How Can I Get Through To You, family therapist Terence Real calls this early indoctrination into patriarchal thinking the normal traumatisation of boys. The way we turn boys into men, he writes, is through injury and violence. We force men to wear a mask of a false self and reward them for this act of soul murder. 
We sever them from their capacity to emote, to feel, to be vulnerable. We subject them to sadomasochistic power struggles designed to turn them into patriarchs. Their suffering is as concrete as empirically observed trends of poor health, alienation, overwork, shallow relationships, and unaliving themselves. So when I talk about Breadtube internalizing patriarchy, the core of what I'm getting at is the wounds, the traumas that we carry inside of ourselves that result from this coercive indoctrination into patriarchy. This pain is internalized, it festers and gets projected outwards in subtle yet pernicious ways. Women's work alongside other marginalized groups is everywhere undervalued, undermined, and underestimated, especially when women step into the traditional domain of men like politics, and Breadtube is no exception. And I know some of you will be thinking, well, aren't some of the top Breadtube creators women? How can you say women's work is undervalued? But just because some women manage to prevail in these political spaces does not mean that structural exclusions do not exist. Politics at every level, grassroots, in the media, and institutionally, has always been controlled and dominated by white cis men. They get to dictate what are considered valid ideas, topics, and paradigms around politics. That which operates outside of this box is not given the same status or validity. What is accredited correct ways of doing politics is then reinforced at every level of society. White cis men then choose like-minded people to work with and promote, and the cycle continues. So unless we intentionally do the work to dismantle the worldview born out of this, what we consider valid ways of doing politics will still be rooted in a racist and misogynistic framework. On Breadtube, I see this framework manifest in how non-men creators and non-white creators have a much harder time being taken seriously or being seen as intelligent, competent, or committed. I think women's work is much more frequently written off as liberal, reactionary, bougie, revisionist, idealist, or apolitical. Whereas men from the same backgrounds and demographics creating similar types of content are not. And of course, most of us will never consciously, explicitly think women have less to offer, but biases are revealed when you see who we share, who we work with, who we watch, what theorists we are encouraged to listen to, what books we are recommended to read. It seems to me we are given a very prescriptive, homogenous, white man list of voices that are considered worthy of our time. Black feminist writer Bell Hooks has talked about how this can become a vicious cycle. You're so used to seeing your experience as default that you don't even know that your perspective is limited in the first place. I read all kind of work. I read patriarchal men whose work I love. And why, how is it that they can live without reading our work? without wanting to hear our voices, even if it's just to be nosy, to, to, <laughs> to, to wonder what those people are thinking. You know, part of the construction of dominator privilege is you don't have to think about what are those other people thinking, feeling, hoping, dreaming. And, and I think part of transformation is when you open yourself to wanting to know what those people that are not like you are doing, thinking, being. And this process of devaluation and scrutinization is not a passive process either. It seems to me there's often a violent backlash against women and other marginalized groups who are successful as a way to put them back in their place. 
Professor Flowers, ContraPoints, Mexi, Lindsay Ellis have all received an onslaught of attacks, harassment and misogyny. But where is the same level of hatred, vitriol and deplatforming of the often far more harmful, frequent and verifiable wrongdoings of white cis men? To me this double standard is not only indicative of internalised racism, transphobia and misogyny, but also how when women step out of line in terms of gender expectations, they are targeted as a way to say, get back in your lane, you're enroaching on our territory. And the sad thing is, many do get put in their place. After the violence they received, Mexi left Twitter, Professor Flowers rarely uploads, Lindsay Ellis left YouTube, and ContraPoints has been on and off both platforms. As in so many other men-dominated work fields, we are once again silenced, invisibilised, and so fade into obscurity. What often ends up happening in this context is that in order for non-white cis men to survive and be taken seriously on this platform, we start to self-censor ourselves to cater our content to a white male audience, especially as it's more lucrative to do so since men make up the majority of BreadTube viewership. So we might start to create dry, theory-heavy content, taking a hard stance about capitalism and class, burying our emotional selves, and making ourselves as attractive as possible to the male gaze. Mexi has spoken about how, when she first started uploading, she made more off-the-cuff casual videos, but after the sexist comments and harassment she received about using filler words and her presentation, she slowly started to curate her videos to be more in line with the breadtube acceptable masculinist content. And I'm often getting well-intentioned advice to be louder, more dominant and assertive in my videos, aka act more like a man. In other words, it's the same thing we've constantly seen with feminism since its inception. Rather than getting us all to value non-cis men ways of being, the onus is on women to aspire to the ways of being and values of men. Feminist author Susan Green put this really succinctly in a Rev Left Radio podcast episode when she said, the women's movement, like so many, I think, movements for social change, make a very correct observation, which is there's something wrong here. And there was something really wrong with the way things were. The problem was the solution, in my opinion, was not correct. The solution was, in order to solve this problem, we as women have to become more like men. Mm. And so women enter the workforce and kind of left the home and adopted the values of patriarchy. And so although the women's movement ended up creating a lot of what I call patriarchs and drag mm. because the, the values of the feminine still continue to be undervalued. What happened through the women's movement is the being realm, the inner realm, emotion, connecting, intuition, the body, which had always been considered second class, it was still considered second class. Mm -hmm. And so we just get a continuation of all the problems of patriarchy. What I began to understand is the external patriarchy is bad enough, but inside of us, we all have an inner patriarch. And until we address the inner patriarch, I don't think anything's going to change. And for me, the problem with the women's movement was the inner patriarch never got addressed. And I know at this point, some of you are probably thinking, well, my work just isn't that good. I'm just fitter. And perhaps there is some truth to that. I still have a lot to improve on and not everyone is going to like my content and that's perfectly valid. But I also think it's important to investigate why do you think this content is not as good? Is it because you're used to associating a strong masculine presence with authority, power and politics? 
Are you used to having your worldview mirrored and reproduced so that when you see content that isn't geared towards white male tastes, you feel affronted? What is it within yourself that thinks less of content by marginalised people? Or maybe you're thinking, I just haven't heard of your channels, it's not my fault, it's the algorithm. But why haven't you heard of them? What voices are you surrounding yourself with? What are you telling the algorithm you do and don't want to see? Whose values are embedded in the way the algorithm prioritises content? And what are you doing to challenge the structural exclusions that might exist? Redtube seems to have a general disregard for feminism. Often this manifests in a class reductionism where there's an assumption that as soon as we have a classless society, all other social issues like patriarchy, racism and transphobia will simply wither away. So a separate push for so-called identity politics is seen as unnecessary and a distraction from the key goal of achieving a socialist or communist society. When feminism is brought up, it's often used instrumentally as a tool to garner attention to other issues and then conveniently forgotten at other times. Like it's okay to tokenistically bring up how women are impacted by class, not because you really care about them, but in order to further your agenda of a communist revolution. Through doing more co-ed organizing, I realized that women's issues were kind of put to the side or not centered enough or maybe taken for granted or lumped in with the larger political project. Yeah, absolutely. And I've I found that to be true as well. In a lot of radical left-wing organizations, there will be sort of a an assumption, at least in some organizations, that because we're already radicals, like feminism is already built in, I don't need to spend much time thinking about it or interrogating myself on my blind spots as, you know, perhaps a man in those spaces. And I think that's a, a critical error that a lot of times ends entire organizations. Even when bread tubers aren't outright class reductionists, there's often a subtle class reductionism where people talk about social issues whilst failing to acknowledge how they intersect with other systems of oppression like patriarchy. I've done this too. I've made videos about the causes of climate change without acknowledging how climate change intersects with other issues like patriarchy and white supremacy that conditions white men into the conquest, control and colonisation of the earth. And I've made videos about dismantling capitalism without acknowledging that capitalism is a logical extension of thousands and thousands of years of patriarchy based on hierarchy, competition and power. In the same way, we can't really talk about being anti-police, anti-military and anti-the Israeli state without acknowledging that the values that undergird this violence are inherently patriarchal. I've also noticed a worrying trend of vulgar anti-feminism, where when feminism is brought up, it's usually only talked about in the context of critique, only ever drawing attention to its worst elements. Of course, there are many things that absolutely should be criticised about many iterations of feminism, like its racism and transphobia, but if our only engagement with feminism is via critique, it gives a lot of leverage to the dismissal of feminism altogether. When I think it's one of the most important movements of the 20th century, we should be able to do both, be critical, but also open to learning from and being humble torch carriers to this incredible lineage. So much of left-wing cultural work today is to try to re reshow people coming up that mm -hmm. actually you do belong to a fascinating, beautiful, gorgeous tradition of radical, you know, feminists and workers and, you know, anti-colonialists and 
um, you know, people that stood up to power and wealth and fought back, and many of them laid down their lives for it. And that tradition has been wiped out, but we can reclaim it. When feminism is talked about in a positive way, another issue I've come across is that only certain forms of feminism are accepted. Leftist men can dunk on right-wing people because they can prove their dominance by inflicting humiliation, pain, or visible signs of inferiority upon others. They can stick up for women being harassed because to do so is protective, chauvinistic, charming. They can take to the streets in abortion protests because to do so is tough and strong. But woe betide the man who rejects masculine conditioning and embraces softness, emotionality, and vulnerability. Or the man who intentionally works towards abolishing the gender binary. Or the man who steps forward and takes responsibility for the fact that he has harmed women. In other words, it's okay to display your feminism, but only so long as it reinforces your masculinity and doesn't challenge you in any way. When feminism is so trivialised and undervalued, it doesn't take long before it's thrown under the bus completely. For example, many creators feel justified in sexualizing women, using ironic misogyny, sending their followers on harassment campaigns against women, laughing at feminists, and using words like bitch and slut when talking about women they don't like. It seems there's a pervasive idea that sexism and misogyny are okay as long as it's against the right people. And speaking from personal experience, when everyone else is ridiculing feminism, it can be very easy as a woman to start to distance ourselves from feminism and feminists by resorting to a cool girl mentality, where we're like, I'm not like other girls, I don't care if you make sexist jokes. I'm not going to call you out or challenge you. I want to be one of the guys. Capitalism and class is the only thing I care about. I think this is an understandable survival strategy because we are so frequently accused of making false accusations, being boring, emotional, irrational, or bitchy. In the same way, I also think the dismissal of feminism from a man can also be understandable. If, as a man, you've been told your whole life that patriarchy is a privilege and all you feel is pain, you feel justifiably resentful. And when no one has shown you empathy for your suffering, it's hard to have empathy for others. It can be easy to cling to just focusing on class, the one way you, as a man, are marginalised, to validate your sense of victimhood. All this to say, I think it's so important we all get curious about where our dismissal or devaluation of feminism is coming from. Do we not mention feminism or identity issues very often? If so, why not? Do we have some form of class reductionism, vulgar anti-feminism, or cool girl mentality? If so, what is it within ourselves that can't hold space for these issues? How does this manifest in ourselves and our work? And how can we challenge ourselves on that? The majority of BreadTube creates a very masculinist framing of how to create social change. Work done in the traditionally masculine public sphere, like agitating, organising, direct action, critical mass support, large-scale projects, and violence, is granted more value than work done in the private domestic feminine sphere, like caring for others, raising the next generation in radical new ways, self-healing, or building the revolution from the ground up. 
To be clear, I'm not saying there is anything inherently feminine or inherently masculine about any of these actions. The point is that under patriarchy, external, visible work done out there in the world is always granted more importance than work done in the internal, relational, emotional realm. And this creates a situation, in my experience, where many people have great politics in theory, which often doesn't translate into how they live their values on a day-to-day -day basis with the people around them in the here and now. I also worry that if masculine values dictate the only valid means of engagement, leftist spaces can become incredibly inhospitable to anyone who doesn't fit this very narrow masculinity. For example, my conditioning taught me that as a woman I should be nice, sweet, soft, never angry, never make a fuss. As a result, I've always been pretty pathetic in protests, occupations, direct actions. I'm just not cut out for these types of actions. But I do think my way of being has helped me facilitate transformative justice, provide emotional labour, create leftist art. Does this make me any less of a leftist? I think it's dangerous to valorise certain forms of engagement as inherently superior to others, because it can end up making a large proportion of the population feel like they have no space on the left. And then people wonder why so few women watch BreadTube or join leftist spaces. Privileging very public, visible visions of social change also perpetuates the great man theory of history that real change happens by one charismatic male leader who, through his brilliance, inspires followers and incites the revolution. I don't think anyone on BreadTube explicitly thinks they will be the next MLK, Che Guevara or Marx, but I think the martyr as opposed to the trickster archetype is still very much alive in our communities. The martyr archetype is serious, macho, hierarchical, perfectionistic, fetishizing suffering and literally dying for the cause. The trickster archetype, on the other hand, is transgressive, fun, light, artful, playful, and doesn't take things so seriously. The right has effectively mobilised the trickster through people like Trump and Boris, who are classic sneaky, funny, cheeky, rule breakers, using tricks and hoaxes. So clearly there's a political appetite for the trickster, and yet the left is still stuck on being martyrs, full of guilt and sacrifice and a better than complex. I just wonder what possibilities could open up for us if we embraced playful exploration instead of rigid dogmas, collaboration instead of individualism, joy instead of misery. I think the trickster achieves more with her vivacity than the martyr does with his solemnity. The martyr approach to social change is also evident in BreadTube as a very intellectual rather than embodied approach to liberation. It's all about proving why you're right and why others should join you via the domain of reason, fact, logic, objectivism, science and the intellect. There's absolutely nothing inherently wrong with these things, but my concern is that these values are so reified that it leaves very little room for non-material, non-intellectual dimensions to revolution. Many indigenous cultures across the globe, for example, time and time again emphasise how their ferocious spiritual bond with the earth is one of the driving forces behind their resistance movements. Leftist theorists like Sonia Renee Taylor, Adrian Marie Brown, Bell Hooks and Audre Lorde emphasise the importance of the emotional dimension to revolution via the power of radical love, trauma work and pleasure activism. And I think a lot of truth lies in Percy Shelley's statement that poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. In other words, yes we need to engage people via the intellect, but often what persuades and mobilises people even more is that which touches our hearts and spirits. 
that which is felt on a visceral, embodied level. But because these things are racialized and feminized as irrational and emotional, they aren't granted the same level of importance. This intellectual dimension to revolution is also evident in the hypersectarianism and dogmatism of the left too, where there are thousands of theoretical debates about which tendency or which theorists make you a real leftist. Of course, I'm not saying accept all ideas willy-nilly, they all to varying degrees deserve scrutiny and critique. My issue is that, on BreadTube, theoretical differences all too often devolve into competitive theoretical battles full of machismo bravado and ego, tearing each other down over minor differences with an air of arrogance over having won. These approaches allow no room for mutual exchange based on a willingness to listen, learn, and grow, which are considered more feminine actions. It's like they're not really interested in ending oppression, they're interested in being the ones that get to oppress. To me, a lot of this arrogance of privileging our ways of doing social change as inherently superior is also scarily reminiscent of the colonial Eurocentric tendency to export white cis men's views across the globe as the one true way of living and being, rather than the more traditionally feminine humility to say, you know what, we don't know what is best for other peoples and places. What strategies are necessary will differ across cultures and time. A diversity of ways of doing and perspectives and worldviews are healthy, and we should each be enabled to take our unique gifts, interests, passions, and put them into fruition so that everyone can do what makes them most excited and energized. To be clear, I don't think this privileging of masculine action at the expense of the feminine is intentionally or maliciously done. I think men are generally not granted any power within in the internal emotional relational realm, so they have to find power without. So if you haven't been able to prove you're much of a man by being rich, tall, a leader, or sporty, BreadTube can offer an opportunity to assert a patriarchal presence via being a theory bro, a martyr figure, or promoting masculinist forms of revolutionary action. In other words, admiration and influence via a patriarchal online presence can be a stand-in for the love, acceptance, and admiration you may truly, desperately crave. So I think it's really important that we get curious within ourselves and our movements. What is the relationship between the actions we promote, our visions of social change, and our masculinity? Where does this come from? How did it get here? How does this masculinist framework shape discourse more broadly on the left? In what ways are we creating a space that is not safe or welcoming for women and other marginalized groups to be a part of? And what taboos are we creating on the left as to what visions of social change are seen as valid? So to end this video, I just want to say, BreadTube is one of the most significant platforms for the sharing of revolutionary thought, but because we haven't done the work to root out our own colonization into patriarchal as well as white supremacist cis-normative capitalistic structures of consciousness, we end up entrenching the same voices, values, worldviews, and ways of being on the left, such that we might succeed at tearing down external oppressive structures and step right into their shoes and become the very thing we sought to destroy. 
And it terrifies me to think what impact this has in limiting perspectives and actions taken in real life organising, what ideas and issues are left out and undervalued, and what damage this does in reaffirming that women and other marginalised groups are inherently inferior. I think at this point people often recommend reading more broadly, listening to women and other marginalised groups, supporting and promoting us, and yes I think these things can absolutely be valuable, but unless we are getting to the root of the problem these will only ever be superficial and temporary solutions. To really root out the patriarchy that lives within requires addressing the fundamental trauma of our conditioning under patriarchy. And this goes for all of us, not just men. As I mentioned at the beginning of the video, patriarchy is a wounding. We all know that hurt people hurt people. Prison abolitionist Danielle Serrad has a brilliant expression that no one enters violence for the first time by committing it. Underneath the most patriarchal oppressive being, there's usually a wounded child crying for help. That's not to excuse or rationalise their behaviour, but an invitation to, with love, understanding, compassion and accountability, self-investigate. I'm curious in what ways patriarchy is living within me. How did it get here? Where did it come from? In what ways did internalising patriarchy emerge as a strategy of survival? In what ways do I allow this to govern the work that I do, the voices I listen to, and the way I see the world? What is the relationship between my own pain and the harm I am inflicting outwards? How would I actually be able to heal this wounding? How can I make amends? How can I get to the most liberated version of myself? And this isn't just an intellectual exercise to ask ourselves these questions. A lot of it has to be felt too. The poet Robert Bly called on men to set free the wild man within in the hopes that in a safe space they could let their souls speak, they could weep and howl and create and play and find again the spirit within. To sit, nurture, look at ourselves and each other, the harm that we have caused and our internalisation of oppression, not with shame and blame, but as a wounded child that is hurting, it changes the conversation and it changes what is possible. I also don't think this is work that has to be done totally alone. I would love to see us creating on BreadTube love-based communities to help ourselves and each other grow. If we are replicating oppression in ourselves and our communities, we know there is healing needed there. Healing and accountability. To paraphrase prison abolitionist Adrian Marie Brown, I would love to create communities where, when harm has occurred, we can say, we are flanking you, we have got you, we are holding you, we are attending to your healing, providing a love that can shelter each other's wounded spirits. I think when we really do the work to rid ourselves of that piece of the oppressor which is planted within ourselves and our movements, that is when we on BreadTube and beyond can begin to do our best work. Very much in line with the writer Sonia Renee Taylor's work on radical permission, I truly believe we each have something life is calling into us which is in alignment with the most liberated, authentic and embodied version of ourselves. In the core of us, the deepest, darkest, quietest, most disavowed parts of ourselves, whether you call it the soul, gut instinct, inner wisdom, spirit, God or something else, we each know what is true for the contributions that we have to make to this earth. 
To get to that place of knowing requires us to liberate ourselves from internalized patriarchy. I guess the biggest thing I hope people take from this video is that yes, we must have a rebellion in the world, but also a rebellion in our consciousnesses. Not only dare to take to the streets, but also dare to heal and do the work of relational recovery. Absolutely be loud, ferocious and angry, but also have the capacity to be quiet, still, look within, feel within, listen within, welding our outward political social revolutions with this deep inner reflection and evolution of our consciousnesses. Thank you so much for watching, I hope this can be a conversation starter, please do leave your thoughts in the comments below. If you gain something from this video, they take a very long time to make a lot of energy, resources and time. Some of the ways you can help reciprocate is by liking, subscribing, hitting the notification bell, sharing this video, commenting, leaving a one-time tip on Ko-fi or PayPal, or becoming a monthly patron. If you've ever considered becoming a patron, now would be a particularly good time, because I've told myself from now to the end of the year is my last real hard try to put everything into YouTube, work on this full time to see if I can make this something financially sustainable for me. If not, I would have to go back to working full time and have a lot less time to upload on YouTube in general. So like I said, if you've ever considered becoming a patron, now would be a particularly good time. If you do become a patron, I create monthly vlogs where I share ideas, thoughts, reflections, things that are alive within me right now, things that I wouldn't put out in public. Mexi and I also co-host monthly book clubs for patrons and a monthly discord call where we in the community decide on different topics to discuss. I'm also linking in the description box some more marginalised creators who don't have much uh, support at the moment. And I'd also recommend FD Signifier's video, John Duncan's video, I'll link them all in the description box, Sarah Z as well, talking about similar topics. Thank you also to Jane and Chrissy and Mexi Nicole for providing valuable feedback on these scripts, I really appreciate it so much. And most of all, thank you so so much for my current patrons for helping make these videos possible, I really couldn't do it without you. I'm just so grateful to you, thank you so much.